Hello, I'm Dr. Russell Barkley, and I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center here in Richmond, Virginia. In this presentation, I'm going to give you an introduction to the nature, diagnosis, demographics, etiologies or causes, life course impairments, and the available treatments for ADHD. This is necessarily going to be an overview, and I won't be able to go into each of those subjects in great detail. But what I will do is at least be able to keep you current as to the status of the field at this time regarding major developments on those particular topics. I want to start with the history of ADHD, which spans more than 230 years, going back to 1770, when the German physician Melchior Weichert first published his medical textbook. And in that textbook, there was a chapter called Disorders of Attention. And in it, he describes what today we would think of as classically being ADHD, the combined presentation. A number of other people have since contributed to our understanding of ADHD, including the Scottish physician Alexander Crichton in his medical textbook from 1798, as well as, of course, George Still's papers in 1902, when he gave a series of lectures on what he then called defects in moral control. But if one reads it, the description of the children as he portrays them clearly maps on to today what we would think of as ADHD. And of course, there have been subsequent developments as well. Not the least of which was in 1937, the accidental discovery by William Bradley of the value of stimulants, specifically amphetamine, for the treatment of ADHD symptoms in adolescents that were under his care at the Emma Pendleton Bradley home in Providence, Rhode Island. Bradley was the first to show that giving medication to these individuals resulted in marked improvement in their attention, hyperactivity, impulse control, and even in their school performance. Since that time, there have been several hundred thousand research papers published on ADHD and its precursor labels such as brain injured child syndrome, hyperkinetic reaction of child, minimal brain dysfunction, uh, minimal brain damage, uh, and then most recently ADD or attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity, which then became ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Over the past 20 to 30 years, we've seen remarkable improvements in studies on genetics of ADHD, neuroimaging of ADHD, and of course, my own research on the life course of children with ADHD. So this slide is simply meant to render in one picture the rather extensive history of ADHD that probably spans as much as 245 to 50 years now. So ADHD has been around a long time. It's not a new disorder, uh, even if people think that it has become more widely known in the popular media, it has been studied in the medical media for quite some time. Now, ADHD is currently diagnosed by a set of criteria in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, which we abbreviate as DSM-5. There is, of course, the International Classification of Diseases, which has its own criteria for ADHD, but they're very, very similar to these, uh, and that is because the two committees work together to formulate their criteria. Nevertheless, in most countries, including here in the United States, the DSM-5 is our standard of care. Now, the DSM-5 has a list of 18 symptoms that are broken down into two dimensions of behavior. These are the two psychological traits that are not developing on time in people with ADHD. 
One dimension, which has nine symptoms, is that of inattention. The second dimension, also having nine symptoms, is that known as hyperactive impulsive behavior, or essentially what I call disinhibition. For children, you have to have at least six of the nine symptoms on either of these lists in order to be diagnosed with ADHD. We lower the criteria somewhat down to five symptoms on each list for anyone 18 years of age and older. They don't need as many of these symptoms to be developmentally inappropriate the way children do. Now, important to understand is that each of these symptoms is qualified by the descriptor often, which means the symptom has to occur often or more frequently in order to be endorsed. It can't just be some of the time or occasionally or rarely. That's very important because very few typical people endorse a symptom when the word often is indicated as its frequency in an individual. Only about three to perhaps 10% in some cases of the general population would endorse that item for themselves or for their children. And requiring that at least six or more of those symptoms be developmentally inappropriate further winnows down or decreases the likelihood that someone will be diagnosed. All of that is to say that we're not simply diagnosing normal childhood behavior with the label of a neurodevelopmental disability or a psychiatric disorder. People who meet just these criteria on these symptom lists are quite unusual, and the vast majority of people would not fulfill that criteria or surpass that threshold. Now, in addition, we also require that the symptoms be not just inappropriate, but persistent. They have to have lasted for at least six months or longer, occurring the majority of the time during that interval. And of course, when that happens, we further decrease the likelihood that a typical person or child might get diagnosed with this disorder. In addition, we want the symptoms to be pervasive. That is, they have to occur in more than one major domain of life. It can't just be a problem at home or a problem specifically doing homework or getting ready for bed. It has to occur in several situations, such as home life, community activities, peer relationships, and in educational settings. At least two or more of those settings have to be where the symptoms are taking place in order to meet this criterion of our diagnosis. Once again, you can see that the diagnosis becomes even more restrictive as we continue to add these stipulations into them. And of course, most important in identifying someone as having a disability or psychiatric disorder in this case is that there must be impairment in major life activities. Having symptoms and having symptoms that occur in multiple situations is not sufficient to get a diagnosis of ADHD. It must be leading to harm. Adverse consequences must be accruing to the individual in order to fulfill this criteria. Those adverse conse consequences can be, and typically are, ineffective functioning in a major life activity, such as in family life, in developing independence, or what we call adaptive functioning, in educational settings, and so on. Are there adverse consequences occurring as a result of that, of these symptoms being deviant in that situation? It can also be an increased risk of injury or morbidity or mortality. Morbidity refers to risk of injury, and ADHD individuals, as we will see, have a very high risk for accidental injury across their lifespan. Accidental injuries of all types. Or it could be an increased risk of early death or mortality. And we know that certain psychiatric disorders do increase the risk of earlier mortality, and ADHD is among them, as we will see later in this presentation. So ADHD handily meets this criterion 
for impairment in major life activities. Now, since ADHD occurs along a spectrum or a dimension of normal human behavior and development, where do we draw the line to separate those who have this disorder from the typical range of behaviors of typical people? It's not only that your symptoms occur often and that you have a number of them and that they're pervasive and persistent. It's when it leads to impairment. That is where we draw the line and that is where we show that the individual is not like other people because bad things are happening to them, adverse consequences. Now, we generally like to see the symptoms developing sometime during childhood or adolescence, and the DSM-5 manual stipulates the age of 12 years or younger. But I suggest that clinicians and others ignore that specific number. We're looking for an onset during development in general. Nature does not respect a specific number like this, and at least 10 to 15 percent of children and perhaps as many as 35 percent of adults who legitimately have ADHD by all of these other criteria may not meet that age of onset requirement. Part of the reason for that is that people are very unreliable in being able to recall the precise age of onset of their symptoms. In my own research, parents and others, including adults, were off by as much as three to five years between when they actually developed the disorder, the symptoms of the disorder, and when they said they developed it. Often their self-report was much later than we actually had established objectively in their history. So that is why we tell people don't place so much emphasis on the age of onset. As long as it is sometime during the developmental period, including up to ages 18 to 21 years, then it would fulfill this requirement. We also like to exclude other disorders that might explain the inattention. Inattention occurs throughout many psychiatric disorders, including psychosis, pervasive developmental disorder, autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, or what used to be called mental retardation. So we want to make sure that another disorder can't explain the inattention. What is specific to ADHD and rarely seen in other disorders is not so much that the person is inattentive, but that they're very impulsive. They're uninhibited. They have very poor self-regulation or executive functioning. ADHD is one of the few, if not the only disorder that has chronic deficits in inhibition that date back to childhood or adolescence. Any other disorder in which we see impulsiveness, the impulsiveness is often episodic, occurring only occasionally, as in manic depression or bipolar disorder. Now, the manual states that there are three presentations or versions of ADHD. In earlier editions of the manual, it declared that there were three types of ADHD but we now know that that is not true. That is why the term was changed to presentations. And all that simply means is that on any given day that a person is being evaluated, some symptoms could be more prominent than others. If the inattentive symptoms are the most prominent and the person doesn't have enough hyperactive impulsive symptoms, at that time we might call them inattentive presentation. The opposite, of course, is true for those with the hyperactive presentation, where the hyperactive and impulsive symptoms are more present or predominant at that time. And of course, people who meet the criteria for number of symptoms on both symptom lists are called the combined presentation. But in no way does this indicate that the individual is of a different type than are the other presentations. Typing people implies some sort of qualitative difference 
across these three groups of people with ADHD. And as far as we can discover, there really aren't any that wouldn't be obvious, of course, from knowing that someone is perhaps more hyperactive than inattentive and so on. But there's nothing qualitatively different about those individuals. Indeed, many children can progress through all three presentations just as part of the normal development of ADHD. They may start out with the hyperactive presentation as those are often the first symptoms to appear in most children during the preschool years. But by entry into school, when there's been sufficient time for the inattention symptoms to emerge, the child might now be relabeled as combined presentation. But the hyperactive symptoms in ADHD decline very steeply with age, such that by adolescence there's a lot fewer of them, and by adulthood they're not diagnostic of people with ADHD. That is, they're not very helpful in differentiating, differentiating adults with ADHD from others. And in that case, the person would now be relabeled from combined presentation to the inattentive presentation. So you can see just as a consequence of the natural life course of ADHD, a person could be labeled with all three presentations. Now, that's the clinical criteria that we use to describe ADHD. <clears throat> but for me, it helps in understanding ADHD to look at it as a researcher like myself would do. What do our research findings tell us is really the nature of these symptoms that distinguish ADHD individuals from others. Well, first of all, let's go back and look at the hyperactive impulsive dimension, that is the disinhibition dimension. I have identified it first because it is the first to develop in children. And even though ADHD starts out with the A for the attention deficits, it really is the hyperactive impulsive symptoms that start first in most cases. Now, what is the nature of this disinhibition or what we call executive inhibition? Well, it's rather widespread. The problems with impulse control, impulse control <clears throat> excuse me, occur across many different domains of human responding. Not only do we see deficient motor inhibition, as is evidenced in their restless and active behavior, but we also see problems with verbal impulse control, where they talk excessively, blurt out answers to questions prematurely, interrupt others' conversations with their own statements. Both of these are well represented in our DSM-5 symptom list for this dimension. What isn't mentioned in the DSM-5, but is equally as important, is that there are three other kinds of inhibition problems that we need to take note of. One of those is cognitive or mental impulsiveness. The individual's thoughts are coming to them very quickly, and they're very scattered and disorganized. Uh, and the individual's thinking is highly prone to being distracted by other thoughts or even by simply just mind wandering. And so the individual finds it difficult to suppress unwanted thoughts when they have to concentrate on something that they need to do or a problem that they need to solve. We also see this impulsive cognition or mental functioning in very rapid decision making. People with ADHD don't stop to contemplate their ideas and the actions that flow from them as well as other people do. So they make decisions and act on those thoughts very quickly. Now, besides the cognitive impulsiveness, there is also a motivational impulsiveness. And by this, what we mean is that the individual has trouble working for larger, later consequences. They prefer immediate short-term consequences that they can have right now that may be smaller in magnitude or value than if they have simply waited and worked longer and therefore earned a larger reward. 
So people with ADHD show this kind of motivational impulsiveness. In economics, it would be called having a high time preference, meaning that you prefer things near in time to things you have to wait for and work for. Or in behaviorism, it might be called reward or temporal discounting, which simply says that the further out in time or the longer the delay is to a consequence, the less value it has to the individual and therefore the less motivating it is to strive for it or to work for it. So there is this impulsive style when it comes to reward seeking behavior, along with difficulties being patient and waiting and working for longer term goals and consequences. Lastly, there is an emotional type of impulsiveness seen in ADHD, in which the individual displays strong emotions very quickly when those emotions are provoked by things around them. It's not that the emotions are bizarre or irrational or necessarily extreme. Other people would have had the same feelings, but they wouldn't have shown such a strong reaction. They would have inhibited or suppressed the initial emotion, tried to calm down and self-soothe, and then act to moderate the emotion so that when they finally displayed a reaction, it might be more tempered, more moderate, more consistent with the situation, less offensive to others, and certainly more in keeping with their longer term welfare. People with ADHD find it extraordinarily hard to inhibit strong emotions and then to moderate or self-regulate them in order to dampen them down and to work for their goals. So expect to see lots of emotion. The emotions are understandable, but the emotional control is immature, like that of a younger person who hasn't yet acquired sufficient control over their emotions. As I said earlier, this dimension of symptoms, particularly the hyperactivity, declines markedly with age and is no longer of much value by adulthood in making a diagnosis. Now, the way a scientist like myself would look at the inattention symptoms would be the following. First, keep in mind that there are between five and six types of attention that the human brain gives to us. ADHD does not interfere with all types of attention. For instance, there's arousal, there's alertness, there's how much we can attend to at any one time, known as the attention span. There's the focus of attention. Can we pay attention to what's important and separate out what isn't? And then there is sustained attention which is better thought of as persistence. It is this last type of attention that ADHD disrupts, not the other types of attention. The person with ADHD therefore has a problem with persistence over time toward tasks, toward goals, and toward the future more generally. They can't string together long sequences of actions in order to go from now to later from where they are at this point to fulfilling the task or the goal that they had set for themselves or that others may have assigned to them. They find it markedly difficult to sustain their actions toward the future, toward a distant or delayed goal or outcome. Now, that is more of a problem with the motor side of the brain the side of the brain, the front part of the brain, that helps to organize, plan, and execute behavior. That tells us that ADHD is not a problem with the back part of the brain or the perceptual brain. That is where most other kinds of attention are located. But ADHD is a problem from the front part, the motor part of the brain. It's a problem with planning, sustaining, executing and monitoring our behavior and actions toward goals. And we simply refer to that as persistence or 
sustained attention, if you like. But keep in mind, it's really a problem with chaining behavior together to get to a goal, not a problem with filtering or perception or the sensory part of the brain. Coupled with this problem with poor persistence is that they can't resist responding to distractions that occur while they're pursuing their goals or doing their work. So this inability to inhibit reactions to goal irrelevant events that are taking place around you is what we mean by being distracted in ADHD. It is poor or impaired resistance to responding to the distraction that is the problem. Again, notice I'm emphasizing that the problem is with behavior and action and inhibiting those actions. The problem with distractibility isn't that the person with ADHD perceives the distracting event any more than anybody else does. All children in a classroom may hear the siren go by or hear the noise in the hallway or see the birds fly by the window. But other children inhibit responding to those events, even if they notice them, because it's not part of what they were asked to do in their classroom. The ADHD child, in contrast, reacts to those events, may get out of their chair, walk to the window, talk about what they saw or heard, so that the individual is responding to the distraction where other people would have suppressed that responding. Another difficulty in this area of attention symptoms is that once people with ADHD are distracted, they find it very difficult to go back and re-engage the goal that they were pursuing, the task that they were completing. This problem with goal re-engagement indicates that ADHD individuals have a problem with working memory. Working memory is one of the seven major executive functions that arises primarily from activity in the front part of the brain. It's a very special kind of memory in which we actively hold in mind what we're doing, the goal that we're pursuing, the steps we need to take to accomplish that goal efficiently, and monitoring our progress toward that goal as we pursue it. That requires working memory, holding information in mind that is being used to guide behavior. It's what older people, such as myself, begin to lose when they reach age 55 to 60 or later. We're not losing our memory. We're losing working memory. We can't hold in mind what we were doing long enough to pursue the goal and complete it. And so we enter a room and forget why we went there. We go outside to get the mail, but never get to the mailbox because we're distracted by the other things around us we think we need to do when we see them. So you see, working memory is remembering to do. This explains the forgetfulness that we often see in people with ADHD. What they're forgetting is what they're supposed to be doing. They're not forgetting their history or facts or knowledge or information. They're forgetting the goal and the steps to pursuing the goal. Finally, as part of this problem with inattention, there is a difficulty with attention to ourselves. What is better termed self-awareness or self-monitoring. People with ADHD have marked problems with self-awareness. They're not paying attention to what they are doing in a given situation, as well as other people of their age are able to do. As a result, they often do not see themselves as having as much problem with a situation or being as impaired in performing a certain task as they really are in the opinions of others around them. And that has to do with deficient self-awareness. For this reason, our diagnostic criteria also require that we corroborate through other people who know the patient well the symptoms that the patient is reporting to us. Now, when we evaluate children,
that's already built in to the evaluation because we'll be interviewing their parents and teachers about those children. But in the case of adults, it becomes very important. We're not just going to take their word for it when they tell us about their symptoms. We're going to interview others who know them well. And why is that? Because the patient with ADHD often under reports the severity of their symptoms or the uh, severity or types of impairments that they are likely to have. So diminished self-awareness is also part of the attention problem because again, self-awareness is simply attention to yourself. And if you're inattentive, you're going to be inattentive to yourself as well. Now, you may not realize it, but I've just described six of the seven executive functions that arise from the front part of the brain primarily, which means that ADHD is probably a disorder of executive functioning. These executive functions allow people to self-regulate over time to accomplish their goals and improve their long-term welfare. That's why we have them, it's why they evolved, and they are mainly subserved through the frontal lobe and its executive networks throughout the rest of the brain. It is for goal-directed, future-oriented behavior. So ADHD is therefore EFDD, Executive Function Deficit Disorder, or Self-Regulation Deficit Disorder. The only executive function I didn't describe was that of planning and problem solving, and they're deficient in mental planning as well. So to repeat, people with ADHD have problems with inhibition, self-awareness, working memory, of which there are two types, visual working memory and verbal working memory, holding things in mind that we have to do. They're also deficient in emotional self-regulation, which leads them to have a problem with motivational self-regulation, because emotions are forms of motivation. And if you can't manage your emotions very well, you won't be able to self-motivate very well either. And the last executive function is the planning and problem-solving one. So I hope you can see that ADHD creates a much wider swath of impairments than just the term inattention is able to capture. ADHD disrupts all of the executive functions to varying degrees and therefore is creating a far more serious problem for the individual in their daily life activities than just being inattentive. Indeed, it's one of the complaints I have about the name of the disorder. It oversimplifies the problem. It trivializes it in comparison to other developmental disabilities like autism spectrum disorder that sound much more serious. But ADHD is a serious disorder too because it's interfering with human self-regulation. And self-regulation is the single best predictor of our success in life, and even our life expectancy. Now, these seven mental abilities are hard for other people to observe and evaluate because by adulthood, they're taking place largely in the mind. And so we can't see the person engaging in working memory or in self-motivation. We can only judge that they're doing so by the outward appearance of their behavior. So I like to think that there are five executive functions in daily life that we are able to see and evaluate. So these seven mental abilities translate into five behavioral abilities in daily life. And those are the daily executive functions. They are self-awareness, self-restraint, working memory, emotional self-regulation, self-motivation, and planning and problem solving. So we can see that all of these are implicated in ADHD. Now, it's important 
when we think about a disorder like ADHD to define our terms a little more precisely because people confuse these all the time. And I'll explain in a moment why that's important. But let's make the distinction first. There is the disorder which is the underlying, in this case, neurological and genetic problems that are giving rise to the difficulties with mental functioning. And we see that on the left side of the, di of the diagram. Genetics, or DNA, is translating to problems with brain growth, interconnectivity, and development. And those are eventually going to give rise to the symptoms of ADHD. As you can see on this diagram, neuroimaging studies have shown that certain parts of the brain, particularly the front part of the brain that you see here, are severely delayed in their maturation in people with ADHD, being about two to three years or more behind in their maturation. So that simply shows you that the genes that are building and operating the brain are of a different kind, a different version of those genes than ones that build typical brain activity or brain growth and connectivity. And in ADHD, it results not only in an immature brain, a brain of smaller size, but as we will see later, problems with interconnectedness among certain brain regions, particularly in the executive brain network. These problems in brain development are the disorder, and they give rise to outward manifestations of problems in thinking and in behavioral expression, and we call those the symptoms of the disorder. So symptoms are the expression of the underlying neurological and genetic problems that ADHD arises from. Now, symptoms need to be distinguished from impairment. As I said earlier, impairment refers to the adverse consequences that occur as a result of showing the symptoms in specific situations. So by not being able to function effectively, the individual is experiencing various harms and other negative or adverse outcomes in the environment. For instance, a child who is inattentive at school may not finish all of their schoolwork. This will result in a lower grade on that paper and perhaps a lower grade on their report card. So the behavior, the lack of sustained attention, is a symptom. The poor grades are the impairments, the consequences. So let's try to distinguish these because impairment does not correlate precisely with symptoms. The correlations between these two are only about 0.5, which is to say that they share maybe 25 to 50% of their variation between them. That tells us that other things contribute to determining how impaired we will be and not just the severity of our symptoms. For instance, in the example I gave about a child doing schoolwork, some of the impairment may have to do with the nature of the classroom, how much assistance the teacher is willing to provide that student for making accommodations for their symptoms. How wealthy is the school district, meaning what resources does the school have in order to help children who have ADHD or other developmental disabilities? So you see all of those things, the teacher, the classroom, the resources, the services, are going to also determine how impaired a child will be in that specific situation which is why you can see that some children may be impaired in one classroom with one teacher, but actually function better and be less impaired in another school or classroom and with a different teacher. So the environment has a lot to do with how impaired your symptoms are going to make you from your disorder. Keep that in mind because many of the things we do to treat ADHD really don't reduce the symptoms all that much, except for medications, for instance.
But the psychological and educational strategies that we use to help manage ADHD really don't reduce the symptoms so much. What they do is reduce the impairment, the harm. They allow the individual to succeed, that is to function effectively in that situation by making those accommodations better than they would had we not made those adjustments or changes to the environment. So you see why it's important for us to keep these separate in our mind. There are disorders, which are the underlying biological problems in my mind. There are the symptoms, the expressions of that disorder, the behaviors, and then there are the impairments, the consequences. Now, you need to understand that ADHD is a dimension of symptoms. It's not just a category. It's not like pregnancy that some children have and others don't. And there's a sharp demarcation or distinction between them. ADHD represents simply the more severe lower end of a dimension of normal human functioning. Just as we can think about human height as falling along a bell-shaped curve that looks like this one. And there are people of average height. Some people are taller. Some people are shorter. And down here, they may be so short as to qualify for dwarfism, for instance. We see the same thing with human intelligence. There are people of average cognitive intellectual ability. Some people may be gifted and other people may have intellectual disability falling toward the lower end of this normal trait of intelligence. We could take many psychological traits and we would find that they fall along a continuum, a dimension, and that they have a distribution that looks something like this in the population. This distribution represents the dimension of normal human self-control executive functioning, or EF. And ADHD represents this extreme lower end of this dimension of normal human self-regulation. So there is average self-regulation that most people have. Others may be very talented in how well they can manage their own behavior over time. These are probably going to be very successful people. But then there are people like those with ADHD. And notice the further toward the extreme end we get, the more likely we are to draw a line and call a person ADHD. As I said earlier, where we draw that line is where impairment begins. But keep in mind, people with ADHD also vary among themselves in how severe the disorder is. In some, it's mild. In others, it's extreme. What they all have in common is the kinds of symptoms they're likely to show and that it's leading to harm or impairment in their lives. So please keep this in mind because it helps us to understand that people with ADHD differ from typical people simply by a matter of degree, not a difference in quality, difference in typing, they're not different humans. They're not a difference in kind. It's a quantitative difference. They simply have less of these traits that are emerging in their development than other people are likely to do. Now, not only does ADHD vary among individuals, but even in the same individual, it varies across situations in how severe it's going to be manifested. In some situations, such as those you see here on the left side of my slide, the individual may show less symptoms of ADHD. They're better functioning in these particular situations, such as when they're doing things they find fun, when they're able to get immediate consequences, when feedback is being given to them frequently, when what they're doing is very salient and important to them. They also do better when it's earlier in the day than later in the day. They're much better when they're supervised than when they're unsupervised. And they certainly seem to function a lot better when we have them one-on-one -on -one 
and doing work with them than when we put them in a group situation, such as a classroom situation, with others. Of course, if what they're doing is very new, that makes it more stimulating and novel, they may pay more attention to it than things that they're very familiar with and so more likely to be bored with. ADHD children are, on average, somewhat better behaved for their fathers than their mothers. We believe that this is for several reasons. Mainly, it's because mothers in most societies still provide the majority of child care and child management. And so it is mothers more than fathers who are likely to encounter the symptoms of ADHD and the problems they cause in family functioning. But a second reason is that ADHD causes problems with how language controls behavior. That's the verbal working memory I mentioned earlier. So that instructions and words and language in general aren't able to govern their behavior as well as it does in typical children. And this explains some of the differences between mothers and fathers, because we all know that mothers use more language and talk more to their children than fathers are likely to do on average anyway. And so mothers are using a particular approach or strategy to childcare that actually goes to the heart of one of the symptoms of the disorder, one of the deficits of the disorder. And it's taxing that deficit in rule-governed behavior, language-guided behavior. So all of that is to say that it's not like fathers have discovered some magical cure for helping an ADHD child. If they spent more time with that child, they'd probably see the symptoms occurring much more often, perhaps as much as the mothers do. As you can see on my slide as well, ADHD individuals behave somewhat better for strangers of whom they're more cautious and reticent to misbehave than they do for people they're familiar with, such as their parents or teachers. And the ADHD child is certainly likely to better behave or to be better behaved uh, in the office with the doctor, in the clinical exam room, than they would be in a more free and open situation like the waiting room where there might be toys and other children. That's because the examination takes place one-on-one, -on -one, may often be done more by a male physician or doctor than a female, although that's changing, of course, as many women enter the fields of mental health and medicine. Uh, and it's a very novel situation to be in a doctor's office with your clothes off, sitting on an examination table and being examined by the doctor. So for all of these reasons, children with ADHD are not likely to misbehave when being examined by a doctor. Doctors need to know this because if they think that what they're seeing is representative of the child and how they behave in more natural situations, the doctor may be less likely to diagnose ADHD, even when it really is there in the natural situation, because they're placing too much importance on behavior in the examination room when they should be putting a lot less emphasis on that very unusual situation that is likely to elicit very atypical behavior, better behavior, in fact. So ADHD individuals are often worse in the situations that you see on the left side of my slide. So expect to see that the child's symptoms of ADHD do change, do fluctuate across various situations and across the day. They may be very good at playing video games, maybe perhaps spending hours of time on the internet gaming. In contrast, they may spend only a few minutes when they're given homework to do. That tells us that somebody might have ADHD. Being able to play a video game doesn't tell me that you're typical or normal. Video games are very compelling for most people. It's the fact that you can't sustain your attention when things are boring and tedious and there are few consequences that surround you. That's when you need your powers of executive functioning more than other times. And that's where it fails. So 
Many parents think that because children play video games well, but don't do homework, they can't have ADHD. That it must be some kind of willful choice. The child is simply choosing not to do their homework. And that's not true. This drastic difference in behavior tells us that the child has a self-regulation deficit because they can't show self-control when it is most necessary. And that would be during homework or schoolwork or in the classroom, more than it would be in front of a computer console playing a video game. Now, how common is ADHD? Well, it varies somewhat around the world. In the United States, it used to be that our study showed about a 2-5% to prevalence of ADHD when we had earlier diagnostic manuals that we use for diagnosis, such as the DSM-3. So on average, about 2-5% to of U.S. children qualified for a diagnosis. But when the DSM-4 and 5 came out, it included a new presentation of ADHD that wasn't acknowledged previously, and that is children who are primarily inattentive. By adding in that group of children who previously would not have qualified for the diagnosis, we almost doubled the prevalence of the disorder, now being between 5 and 8% of U.S. children compared to earlier versions of the diagnostic manual. So one reason for the rise in prevalence of ADHD in the U.S. and perhaps in other countries as well was the change from one earlier diagnostic manual to more recent diagnostic criteria that were more broadly construed and included individuals with inattentiveness who wouldn't necessarily qualify in earlier um, periods of history. In the U.S., about 4 to 5 percent of adults would qualify for adult ADHD. Now, when we look around the world, we see that the prevalence is about the 4 to 5 percent figure for children in other countries. Although recently, as other countries have adopted the DSM-5 diagnostic manual, their prevalence can be as high as 7 or 8 percent, being very similar to what we see in the United States. Studies in Italy, in Spain, in South Korea, in Japan, and even in China show that when you apply the same criteria that we use in the United States, the prevalence of the disorder is approximately the same. So although there's some variation across countries, it has to do with the diagnostic criteria and the way that children might be assessed for their disorder in those countries. Now notice toward the bottom of my slide that ADHD also can vary in prevalence based on certain demographic factors. For instance, ADHD is three times more common in boys than in girls among children. It can be as high as five to one boys to girls in clinic referred samples. By adolescence, the sex ratio falls to about two to one boys to girls, and by adulthood, it's as low as one and a half males to females. So that the sex ratio is becoming equivalent with age. We're not sure why that is, but it may have to do with the fact that some studies have recently shown that girls may have two stages to the onset of their disorder, not just one earlier one like boys do. So girls may develop their symptoms as early as boys, but by adolescence and at the start of puberty, there is a second blip or increase in onset of prevalence of the disorder for females. So that notice by adolescence, more females have developed the disorder than in childhood and certainly by adulthood, such that by adulthood, there are very few differences between men and women in the prevalence of their disorder or in its severity. ADHD is somewhat more common in lower classes, lower socioeconomic classes, than it might be in upper income classes 
parts of society. And that may have to do with medical care that is provided across, across the different social classes in a society. We know that some of the factors that cause ADHD are the result of acquired damage to the nervous system. Not all ADHD is genetic. To the extent that some groups of people, some lower social classes, may experience more hardship, malnutrition, birth complications, head trauma, disease, and so on, then those classes may be more likely to show ADHD, particularly in these acquired forms, than they would the more inherited or genetic form of ADHD. We also know that ADHD is more common in very dense population areas like inner cities in the United States than it is in suburban and rural areas of the country. Again, this may have to do with social class, economic status, and poverty. We know that very dense population areas are often impoverished areas. And once again, with impoverishment may come an increased risk for biological hazards and medical diseases that could give rise to ADHD as a consequence. Finally, in my country, I like to point out to people that ADHD may be found in the children of adults in certain occupations. For instance, adults who are in the military or adults who may be in the performing arts, like rock music, for instance. Why would the children of adults in those professions be more likely to have ADHD? And the answer is because more adults with ADHD are likely to choose to go into those professions. They self-select into certain professions in which their symptoms may not cause them as much difficulty in functioning. And therefore, since more adults with ADHD gravitate and go into those professions, and since a lot of ADHD is genetic and inherited, those adults are going to have more children with ADHD as well. So it's not that there's anything about the military or performing arts or rock music or sales or something like that. There's nothing about those professions that's causing the ADHD. It's explained more, I believe, by the fact that adults with ADHD are likely to find those professions to be more satisfying and less impairing with their symptoms. We have no evidence that there are any differences across racial or ethnic groups in the prevalence or nature of ADHD that we can attribute to their ethnic or racial differences. ADHD is an equal opportunity disorder that occurs across all races or ethnic groups. It could vary in its prevalence as a result of poverty and other factors like medical care that I've already mentioned. But those are due to economic and medical care factors. They're not at the essence of them due to racial or ethnic differences. Now, how often does ADHD persist into adulthood? Excuse me, let me just have a drink of water and I'll explain. Studies indicate that about 70 to 80 percent or more of children diagnosed in childhood can be re-diagnosed in adolescence 10 years later with ADHD. So it's a highly persistent disorder over the first 10 years following diagnosis. And even the 20 to 30 percent who no longer qualify for the diagnosis have not necessarily become normal or typical. Most of them remain quite symptomatic, but they don't have enough symptoms to meet all of our criteria for diagnosis. And therefore, they fall kind of in a gray or shaded area, a borderline area of disorder, where they don't meet full criteria to be diagnosed, but they're not typical of other people their age either. They're highly symptomatic, but not necessarily diagnostic or diagnosable. Now, 
About 10% of teenagers can be said to have recovered from their disorder by that time. The remaining 20% or more are that symptomatic group I've just mentioned. By the time we reach young adulthood, let's say age 21 or so, uh, we find that it depends on who you ask as to how prevalent the disorder continues to be, how much it persisted. So for instance, if you now, instead of interviewing the parents of this person like you did when they were children, if you interview the adult with ADHD about themselves, notice that only about three to eight percent of the individuals describe themselves with enough symptoms to meet the diagnostic criteria. In my study, we were using the DSM-3 back then. So we found that about 3 to 8 percent would qualify for the diagnosis. So if we relied only on the adult self-report, we would say that most people outgrow ADHD by adulthood. But of course, that's not true, because I told you earlier that ADHD limits self-awareness. So if I shift over to calling the parents back in and interviewing them again, as I did during the earlier childhood years of these children in my research, I would find that almost 10 times more of these people would qualify for the diagnosis based on their parents' report. That's a rather remarkable difference, isn't it? Say 4% if I interview the patient, but 46% if I call up their parents and talk to them. This illustrates the problem with self-awareness that I made earlier. People with ADHD may not think they have a disorder or that they're as symptomatic or as impaired as they really are. As a result, we don't want to put too much emphasis or importance on their reports of their own symptoms, but we need to interview others who know them well. Now, there's also a problem with the DSM I can illustrate here for you. The DSM symptoms, even in the DSM-5, were initially based on research on children, back in the days when we didn't think adults could have this disorder, that most children might outgrow it. So there was an emphasis in writing the symptoms, in determining the language, that it be applicable to children. I think you can see where that would cause a problem, because now if we try to use those symptoms to evaluate an adult, we're using symptoms more characteristic of a child. And of course, many people may outgrow the child version of the symptoms, yet continue to have the disorder into adulthood. So to illustrate this problem that people can outgrow the DSM symptoms, but not really outgrow their disorder. Look at the next number here, the 66%. That's how many children in my study would qualify as having ADHD if I used a developmental threshold, the 98th percentile in the population. In other words, are you as severe as 98% of people your age in what your parents say about you? using these parent reports. That's a very severe threshold to use to label a disorder. But we wanted to make a point, and that is that even using a very rigorous, strenuous, restrictive criteria for diagnosis, two-thirds of the children in that study would meet that approach, that criteria for diagnosis. So the difference between the 46 and 66 percent is the problem with the DSM. That's how many children outgrew the DSM but didn't outgrow their disorder. So it's fair to say that about two-thirds or more of children with ADHD will fully qualify for the disorder when they reach adulthood. And even more of them remain impaired in various life activities, such as in self-care, family functioning, relationships with peers and others, marital functioning, and especially educational and occupational functioning. 
So even if people outgrow enough symptoms that they can't be diagnosed with the disorder, they still may be experiencing some impairment or harm from those symptoms and from having grown up with the disorder. By age 27 in my own research, this was a, a group of children I followed to about age 27 to 32, we found that fully 14% could be said to have recovered from the disorder by both their report and their parents' report. So a very strict definition. If I loosen up the definition of recovery so that one or the other person said you had recovered, it might be as high as 35% could be said to have normalized or recovered from their disorder. But notice that the remainder, two-thirds or more of these individuals, remained fully symptomatic and even continued to meet the diagnostic criteria for the disorder. So that is why we say that ADHD is a highly persistent disorder into adulthood, where symptoms may persist enough to produce impairment in life activities, even if the person is outgrowing the DSM criteria that were largely developed for use with children. Now, the adverse consequences that we see accruing to people with ADHD across the lifespan can be summarized here. There are thousands of studies on these impairments and risks. Not all people with ADHD experience every one of these problems, of course not, but they are more likely to experience harm in these areas of functioning than are other people of the same age. <clears throat> Time doesn't permit me to go into great detail about these various risks and outcomes. This is, after all, just an introduction or an overview of the disorder. But let's take a look at the variety, at the diversity of harms that can happen if you grow up with ADHD. One, of course, is that it will impact adversely your school functioning. Over 90% of people with ADHD in childhood are doing poorly at school because of their symptoms. It is the number one domain of impairment that we see ADHD causing. Of course, there's lots of conflict within the family. Uh, that is true of most families with ADHD. Uh, in, ch in their children, especially if the child goes on to develop oppositional defiant disorder, as many ADHD children are likely to do within a few years of the onset of their ADHD. Of course, as children begin to interact with other children in the community, their ADHD symptoms interfere with their relationships, resulting in them having fewer friends or even no friends and being rejected by the more typical peer group. 50% of children with ADHD have no close friends by second grade in school. And that figure is even higher if the child also now has oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder. Now, conduct disorder is a pattern of antisocial behavior, such as lying, stealing, fighting, and later on, maybe even carrying a weapon or confronting victims. You might think of it as delinquency or criminal conduct, but in the DSM, it's called conduct disorder. About one in four ADHD children, at a minimum, is likely to further develop into conduct disorder. About 40% are likely to engage in antisocial behavior, even if they don't meet all the requirements for a diagnosis of a conduct disorder. We know that this group of children who moves into antisocial activities are also the group most likely to experiment with, use to excess, and even abuse legal and illegal substances. So they may smoke more often than others, tobacco that is, which may lead them to try marijuana more often than others. We know that by adulthood they consume more alcohol than do others. 
and that they're more likely to become dependent or addicted to nicotine, to marijuana, or to alcohol by their adult years. And so they have a substance use disorder, abbreviated SUDS, S-U-D-S, as you see on the slide. As they become sexually active, we find that children with ADHD are likely to start sexual activity earlier than others. They don't have any more sexual disorders or perversions than other people do, but they may start sexual intercourse at a younger age, probably related to their poor impulse control. And because they are more likely to start sexual activity earlier, and that they are more likely not to use contraception, and also that they change partners more often in their sexual relations. All of this leads us to discover in our research that people with ADHD are more likely, indeed 10 times more likely, to have a pregnancy during their teenage years than other children were likely to experience upon reaching adolescence and becoming sexually active. We also found that they were four times more likely to have had a sexually transmitted disease by the time they reached young adulthood. So children with ADHD, as they reach adolescence, are more sexually active, more risk-taking, taking fewer precautions, and more likely to have had a child or contracted a disease from their sexual activity than are others. So this is something that families have to prepare for as their young people with ADHD become sexually active. As I mentioned earlier, accidental injuries are very common among people with ADHD. Indeed, children with ADHD are nearly twice as likely to die before the age of 10 from an accidental injury as our typical children. And adults with ADHD are nearly five times as likely to die by age 46 or midlife, primarily due to accidental injuries, than our typical adults by that age. After adolescence and into early adulthood, another cause of early mortality also occurs, and that is an increased likelihood of attempting suicide. Now, it's having depression with your ADHD that makes a teenager contemplate suicide. Think about it. But it's their impulsiveness that goes with their ADHD that makes them more likely to attempt and even succeed in suicide. So it's the combination of the ADHD impulsiveness with the possible development of depression that when the two go together, greatly increases the likelihood of a suicide attempt. Yet another reason for early mortality in children and adults with ADHD. When they get their driver's license and start to operate a motor vehicle, we see that they do so in a very risk-taking, impulsive, and distracted manner. They speed more often with motor vehicles. They take more chances so that there's risk-taking involved. As a result, they have more crashes with the vehicle and they receive more citations from the police as teenagers than other teenagers are likely to do. And these problems are likely to, to continue into adulthood. And by adulthood, when the increase in alcohol use occurs, we find that adults with ADHD are more likely also to have received a citation from the police for driving under the influence of alcohol, or abbreviated DUI, on my slide here. As they leave school, they often leave with less education. Many of them may fail to complete their formal education, and certainly much fewer of them are likely to go on to college. Indeed, in our studies here in the United States, only about 5 to 10% of people with ADHD ever complete a college degree. Compare that to the 40% of adults in the U.S. who are likely to do so. And you can see that ADHD 
results in a marked reduction in the amount of years of education a person is likely to have obtained. This, of course, is going to have an impact on the person's occupational choices and their occupational functioning and how much money they earn in life and their financial difficulties. So it's not a surprise to learn that as ADHD children grow up, leave school and go out into the workforce to try to earn a living and find a job, that they're going to have more difficulties in their work than other adults do. Complaints we hear from their supervisors are very similar to the complaints we heard from teachers when this person was in school. Can't finish their work. Doesn't work independently very well. Often is late for work. Tries to take shortcuts in their work and not do as much as others. Often shows much more emotion at work, inappropriate emotion. As a result, they're more likely to be dismissed from a job because of their impatience, anger, hostility, even aggression. Certainly they change jobs more often than other people do, about three times more often during any 10 year period. They will change jobs and that is out of boredom and they often quit impulsively before they even have another job lined up to go to. It's not uncommon to see a very checkered pattern of functioning in their work careers, that is switching jobs frequently and not moving up the career ladder as quickly as other people do, because they simply don't stay with any given employer or occupation as long as others. So of course, they earn a lot less money per year, about $12,000 less here in the US. They don't save up as much of their money as others, often having no or few savings in the bank. They often are very impulsive at using credit cards or borrowing money. And as a result, they owe more money to others. And they often are likely to have a poorer credit rating with credit rating agencies than do other people. Now, there are medical problems that occur over development that we begin to notice by adolescence and adulthood. One is that they have an increased risk for obesity. They're more prone to sedentary activities, to gaming, to streaming, to using technology, and to not paying as much attention to maintaining their health and their weight and their diet and nutrition as other people do. And so it's no surprise that twice as many of them will be obese by adolescence and adulthood. And of course, with obesity comes an increased risk for coronary heart disease, abbreviated CHD on my slide here. They're going to have increased problems with their blood cholesterol. They're going to be at an increased risk for type two diabetes. And of course, I already mentioned that they'll continue to have problems with accidental injuries and possibly even earlier mortality. There are many other risk factors I'll mention in just a moment that occur medically in the lives of people with ADHD, but this gives you the impression of yet another domain of impairment stacked on top of all these others that can occur to people growing up with ADHD. People with ADHD are less likely to get married, and if they do marry, they're more likely to separate or divorce from their partners. And when they are living with another adult, cohabiting or in marriage, there's a greater likelihood of conflict and even interpartner violence within the relationship because of the problems with emotional self-regulation. And then as ADHD children grow up, have their own children and become parents, if their ADHD has persisted into adulthood, we can show that it interferes with their parenting ability, with their care of their children. I hope you see that ADHD turns out to be one of the most impairing disorders we see in outpatient mental health clinics, far more impairing than depression, anxiety disorders, relationship problems, learning disabilities, and so forth. 
very few disorders have such a wide array of adverse consequences across so many different domains of adult functioning than does ADHD. So I hope you appreciate the seriousness of this disorder if it goes untreated. Luckily, research has shown that with treatment with ADHD medications in particular, but also combining those medications with educational and psychological treatment programs, we can, in fact, markedly reduce the risks for most of these domains of impairment, provided that the patient remains within treatment and stays on medication, especially through the critical adolescent years when many of these harms begin to become evident. So on the one hand, ADHD is a very impairing disorder when it goes untreated. On the other hand, ADHD is among the most treatable psychiatric disorders we know of, having numerous treatments that produce significant improvement, not only in reducing their symptoms, but in reducing the risk they may have for experiencing these various harms or impairments. This slide is simply to show you in detail the various kinds of difficulties or impairments that can occur in each of the domains that I spoke about. I show it here only because I want it to be part of any handout that you might be given that goes with this presentation so that you can see the specific difficulties ADHD is likely to create, many of these I've already mentioned. One that I alluded to or mentioned earlier is that ADHD might have an adverse effect on longevity, on life expectancy. Now, we already have established that it increases the likelihood of accidents and of early death by accidents in childhood and up to midlife. But what about after midlife? Do these problems that ADHD is causing lead to an accumulation of risk so that toward later life, we see a shorter lifespan than we would see in others? And the answer is yes, we do. If you look at the third line of my slide here, you can see all of the things I've mentioned that ADHD was posing a risk for from aggression to crime to drug use to violence to a high risk of suicide. At some point, all of these, including their lower health status, have an effect on your life expectancy. These are the very things that insurance companies would use in order to calculate your estimated life expectancy. Since ADHD predisposes to problems in nearly all of them, it's not surprising we should see a reduction in total longevity. All of these behaviors I've mentioned are related to the personality trait called conscientiousness. Conscientiousness refers to do you think about the consequences of your actions before you do them? Do you contemplate your longer term welfare and use that to make decisions in your daily life? ADHD is associated with very low conscientiousness. So not surprising, ADHD would be expected to shorten your life expectancy. And we see that it does. As you can see here, I've already mentioned that ADHD is likely to pose twice the risk of early death in childhood, nearly four and a half to five times the risk of early death in adulthood. But that's early death due to accident. Look down at the bottom of the slide and you will see the results here of my own study published a year ago which was the first study to compute estimated life expectancy, given everything we know about ADHD children growing up. These results come from my own follow-up study in Wisconsin, in the United States, where we followed children for more than 20 years into adulthood, and we did complete physical exams and thorough psychiatric evaluations of them.
And what we found is that if they had ADHD in childhood, even if they recovered from it by adulthood, their life expectancy was estimated to be about nine to 10 years less than that of other children. But what happens if their ADHD did persist, that they could be re-diagnosed in adulthood with the same disorder, ADHD? The reduction in life expectancy was between 12 and 13 years. That's a lot. It may not sound like much to you, but ADHD has more of an effect detrimentally on life expectancy than most of the great public health concerns we have that shorten life expectancy. It's far worse than obesity, than smoking, than using alcohol to excess, and all of the other difficulties we've talked about, such as poor nutrition, limited sleep, and so on. All of them have a small but detectable effect on shortening our lifespan. ADHD is worse than all five of the big public health concerns combined. So that should, I think, lead to a very sobering impression that ADHD is a very serious disorder and that it's not just a mental disorder or a psychiatric disorder or an educational disorder. It's a public health disorder because it leads people to engage in choices in their daily life with regard to their health, their health maintenance, and so on, their nutrition, their exercise, their dental care, their weight and risk-taking and substance use. It leads them to make poor choices across all of these and other domains, which eventually will add up to take a toll on their longevity, their life expectancy. So the answer to the question at the top of the slide is yes, ADHD does shorten life expectancy if it goes untreated into adulthood. Now, most people with ADHD have a second disorder, about 80% of them, in fact. Not only do they have ADHD, they have one or more of the disorders that you see on this slide. More than 50% have at least two of the other disorders that you see here. So it's very common in psychiatry to see that when a person has one disorder, it may link up and increase the risk for a second or third related disorder. In this case, as I've already mentioned, ADHD increases the risk for other impulse and emotional disorders, such as oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, or antisocial behavior, and eventual crime. Substance use disorders, which as I said, go along with these other two. Then, as I mentioned, a risk for depression. About 25% of ADHD children develop depression by adolescence. And if they're not depressed, by adulthood, nearly a third of them qualify for a milder form of depression called dysthymia, right? A small percentage, maybe 10 to 15%, may develop this new mood disorder known as disruptive mood dysregulation disorder that is a combination of very impulsive, aggressive behavior and destructive behavior with a pattern of irritable, depressed mood. We used to think that this was a form of bipolar or manic depressive disorder, but research now shows that it's its own separate mood disorder. Anxiety disorders occur in about 15 to 25 percent of ADHD children, but that figure doubles by adulthood to 40 to 50 percent if the adult went untreated during their adolescent and adult years. The longer ADHD goes untreated, the more likely an anxiety dis disorder can occur with it. A small percentage of ADHD children may be prone to tic disorders, even fewer to Tourette syndrome, certainly less than three to 5%. About four or 5% may develop obsessive compulsive behavior, although interestingly, 
as many as 10% in some studies may develop excessive hoarding as a problem. Autism spectrum disorder, as we see at the bottom here, is also a risk. 20 to 25% of ADHD children may qualify for this other neurodevelopmental disorder. And a small percent, perhaps 5 to 7%, may qualify for intellectual disability or what we used to call mental retardation. So the risk for these two disorders, other neurodevelopmental disorders, is not real high, but it's higher than you would see in the general population. One of the most common coexisting disorders with ADHD is a specific learning disability, a delay in one or more areas of academic achievement, such as reading, spelling, math, language, or handwriting. Over half of ADHD children will have a second disorder of specific learning disability. And more than half of them qualify for developmental coordination disorder. So poor is their motor development uh, coordination and so on. We find that upwards of maybe 15% to 20% have some problem with language development and communication, particularly in the oral expression of language and the motor control of the oral musculature. Finally, we see that by adulthood, some people with ADHD, especially if they had conduct disorder by adolescence, go on to develop a risk for certain personality disorders. Among them is antisocial personality, what some people often think of as psychopathy. This occurs in about 20 to 25% of ADHD children by adulthood. A smaller percentage of them, maybe 10 to 15%, qualify as having bipolar, or excuse me, borderline personality disorder. And then even fewer have what we call passive aggressive personality. But again, what I want you to understand here is how impressive it is that ADHD individuals carry a very high risk for developing one or two or more other disorders. And often, the second and third disorder are going to affect the kinds of treatment that we provide them and even affect the choices we make of ADHD treatments than we would expect to see in the general population. This is just a list, I've already gone over these with you, of each of those disorders and the frequency, that is the risk for which they are likely to occur in children with ADHD. I wanted you to be able to take this as part of the handout you might be given of these slides after watching this program. By the way, notice at the bottom of the slide that females growing up with ADHD are more likely to have an eating disorder. About 16% of them, in fact, had developed impulsive binge eating pathology or outright bulimia. They don't have an increased risk for anorexia, the more restrictive eating disorder that goes with perfectionism. Indeed, ADHD lowers the risk for anorexia below the risk seen in the general population. Why do we see ADHD individuals being at risk for these other disorders? A year ago, a large study of tens of thousands of people, of normal people, and of people with various psychiatric disorders had their entire genome, that is, all of the known active genes in the human genome, were scanned looking for genes that pose risk for various disorders. They then added up how many of those risk genes people got and whether or not those risks predicted other disorders besides the disorder that they had. So look here specifically at ADHD. Look at the bands that go to other disorders. The wider the band and the darker its color, the greater is the genetic relationship between those disorders. So that if you have ADHD, 
the genes that you have that are contributing to the risk for your disorder are also contributing to risks for, look here, anxiety disorder, down here, major depressive disorder, over here, post-traumatic stress disorder. And then because this color goes in the opposite direction, see this, it's negative, having ADHD genes decreases the risk for anorexia. Although, as I said, it does increase the risk for bulimia. Again, the point of this slide, especially for a layperson, is to show you that one reason that ADHD individuals are high risk for coexisting disorders is genetics. The genes for certain disorders are also genes for other disorders, elevating the likelihood that if you get one, you may get the other. Let's take a look momentarily at the causes, the etiologies of ADHD. Excuse me. We can conclude from thousands of studies in this area that ADHD arises from multiple sources, not just one. So there's not going to be a single gene for ADHD, nor is ADHD necessarily always caused by genetic factors. There are multiple things that interact to lead to ADHD developing. But we know that all of the recognized causes to date are in the realm of biology, medicine, specifically neurology and genetics. We have no evidence now that ADHD can arise purely from social factors such as diet, parenting, poor education, and so on. So that social factors, conditions in society, are not going to cause ADHD unless they also increase the risk for a biological factor. So for instance, poverty doesn't cause ADHD, but because being in poverty can lead to malnutrition increased drug abuse such as alcohol and tobacco use. It can lead to increased pregnancy complications and even premature delivery of the child. So all of those biological risks may occur in impoverished groups more than others. And those are the factors that are influencing brain development and through those adverse influences contribute to risk for ADHD as well. So even where it might look like a social factor, like economic status, is related to ADHD, it's because that factor is related to other biological risks that pose harm to the development of the nervous system. So ADHD arises largely from genetic, and other neurological factors. We will find that there are people with ADHD that is familial, inherited, and genetic. We will also find some people with ADHD where their ADHD arises because of major genetic disorders like chromosome problems and breakages. But then there's going to be another group of ADHD that didn't inherit their disorder or have a genetic problem but because they were exposed to biological hazards are going to have problems with the development of their brain and especially of the brain's executive networks. And that is going to give rise to an acquired version of ADHD. Now we also know that there are multiple genes that cause ADHD and these genes might interact with some things in the environment to further increase risk. For example, we know that if a child inherits several of the ADHD risk genes, they may be three to four times more likely to have ADHD. But if their parents drank alcohol, especially the mother, during her pregnancy with this child, it magnifies the risk to eight times the risk of having ADHD in that child. So certain genes for ADHD may interact with certain toxins or diseases in the environment to further increase 
the risk for the disorder. And we're beginning to see evidence of that as well. We also might see that the genetics of ADHD leads you to engage in certain risk-taking behaviors that are going to come back and cause brain injury. So for instance, a someone with ADHD takes more risks, becomes more impulsive, has more accidental injuries, including traumatic brain injury, or TBI, as I say on this slide. And we know that traumatic brain injuries can cause ADHD even in someone who didn't have it before and can worsen ADHD in someone who already has it. So there, the genes for the disorder create a behavior pattern that causes a risk for injury and the injury feeds back to increase further the risk for and severity of their ADHD. Despite all of this complexity, all of these multiple causes, ADHD arises from a single common pathway. Whatever it is we're looking at as a cause has been shown to have some effect on the development of the front part of the brain and the brain's executive network, often called the fronto striatal cerebellar network. But that's no matter. The words here, the terms aren't important. What is important is that there's a network in the brain that is responsible for self-control, for executive functioning, and ADHD adversely affects that network and that leads to the symptoms of the disorder. As I've said, there's simply no evidence that purely social factors like parenting or like playing video games or too much screen time on your smart technology causes ADHD. We have no evidence supporting that. So to summarize what I've said in the last slide in a picture, this is from a book by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Joel Nigg at the University of Oregon Health Sciences Center. And it shows in a very simplified form all of the causes of ADHD and what percentage or proportion of ADHD cases is it likely to cause. As you can see here, Genetics, inheritance, accounts for about two-thirds of all cases of ADHD in the population. The disorder runs in families. The child has inherited the genes for the disorder from one or both parents and other relatives, and that increases the likelihood they're going to have the same disorder that the relatives had. I do want to point out, however, that about 10% of ADHD of the cases put in the genetic category arise from a new discovery that was shown in the past few years. And that is that new mutations can occur in the genes that the child inherits that the parents don't have. These new mutations, often called de novo mutations, can happen in the sperm and the egg of the parent so that when we do a blood test of the parent and we look at their DNA, we don't see any of these risk genes. And yet, when we look at the child's DNA, they're there. How did they get there in that child? Because at some point during the process of creating the genes in the egg and sperm that go to the child, a mutation took place and it converted a typical gene into an ADHD risk gene. And now that increases the odds the child will have the disorder, even though those genes and the disorder do not occur in that family before then. About 10% of ADHD cases arise from such new mutations. The other third of ADHD cases, as you see here, come from the other factors that I've already mentioned, such as being born prematurely or having a very low birth weight, such that you have to go into a neonatal intensive care unit for a while before you're allowed to be released to your family. It can come from being exposed to toxins like fetal alcohol exposure, other toxic ingredients, or even consuming lead in early childhood. Smoking was thought to contribute to ADHD, but we can now put a question mark next to that because it turns out that it may not be the smoking, that smoking is a marker that the parent has ADHD, and that's why they're smoking, 
during the child's pregnancy. So it's not the smoking. It's the fact that adults with ADHD are more likely to smoke and it's the genetic relationship between the parent and the child that's the cause here. The smoking is just a signal, an indicator that the adult, excuse me, one of the parents has ADHD. Pregnancy complications, infections, uh, birth complications such as respiratory distress syndrome and others can also contribute to injury to the brain, particularly to the front part of the brain and that could cause risk for ADHD as well. And then there are many other very small factors here, possibly pesticides, vitamin deficiencies, infections with other viruses or bacteria. Perhaps, for instance, the streptococcal bacteria might also increase risk for ADHD. So these other factors are also biological factors. But all of this is to say there is no social factor on this diagram that by itself causes ADHD. And it is for that reason that ADHD has now been classified in our diagnostic manual as a neurodevelopmental disorder. Another reason for classifying it are the neuroimaging findings that we see in hundreds of studies of brain size, connectivity, and functioning. Excuse me. These studies can be summarized very simply, and I'm oversimplifying what are very complex research findings, that there are certain parts of the brain that are smaller, less active, less mature in people with ADHD than in typical people of the same age, based on various neuroimaging measures, such as MRI or fMRI or PET scans and so on. That doesn't concern us here. What concerns us is that there's a very consistent pattern across many of these studies showing that the frontal lobe, particularly the orbital frontal area here, and also the right side of the brain more than the left frontal lobe, that are smaller, less active, and less mature than they should be. The midline at the frontal lobe between the two hemispheres, known as the anterior cingulate cortex, is also smaller and less functional. These areas of the brain project nerve cells, networks, back into the central part of the brain. And one of those central areas is the basal ganglia. And we have found that this area of the brain is also smaller, less active, and delayed in its development. A fourth area is at the back of the brain, the ancient older brain called the cerebellum. Often it's thought that this is involved in motor coordination, in the timing of our actions and their smoothness, their gracefulness, if you will. But we know that the cerebellum is critical to higher mental activities like thinking, planning, and self-regulation. So it's not surprising to find that parts of the cerebellum are less active, smaller, and delayed in development more than in typical people. There is some evidence that the bundle of fibers that connects the left and right hemispheres of the brain, known as the corpus callosum, that the front part of that bundle of nerves, the splenium, is also smaller. But that would make sense. If the frontal lobes are smaller, then no surprise that the fibers of nerves that connect them would be smaller too. A little bit of evidence that a structure deep in the brain near the basal ganglia called the thalamus might also be smaller, but that's less certain. We do know that the size of these brain areas and the degree of activity in them is directly correlated with how severe your ADHD is going to be. So we have connected the dots, so to speak, in the diagram. The neuroimaging findings are related to the behavioral symptoms of the disorder. And while there's a few small gender differences between boys and girls or between men and women, they're not worth mentioning here because they're not important to our understanding of ADHD, despite the fact there might be a few differences. Critics of ADHD 
particularly social critics who are against giving medication to ADHD, such as the Church of Scientology here in the United States. Members of that church have criticized these findings by saying that these problems with brain development were the result of giving ADHD medications to these children, and that's what caused the injury. Well, of course, that's not true, and to prove it, all of these studies have since been repeated with children and adults who never took ADHD medications, and we find exactly the same results. So don't let anybody scare you into thinking that ADHD and the medications we use to treat it, that the medication causes the brain damage. It does not. This is just one of hundreds of studies that illustrates the degree of delay in ADHD. I showed it earlier on my second slide about the history of ADHD. And what you see here is that the darker the color, the greater the delay is in the maturation of this outside area, the gray matter, the cortex of the brain and that it's mainly in the frontal lobes, which are here. If we look down on top of the brain, which is what the perspective is here, we can see that it's primarily the frontal lobes. Here's the right and the left frontal lobe that are delayed in their development. The frontal lobes are the executive brain. They allow for self-regulation. To some extent, you will notice the back part of the brain here is also delayed in maturation. Why is that? After all, these are the visual centers of the brain. Well, as I said, ADHD greatly interferes with working memory. And one type of working memory is visual imagery. The ability to reflect and recall images and thoughts about your past as you think about what you're going to do. We use visual imagery a lot for self-regulation, much like you use it in your GPS in your car. So we should not be surprised then to see that some of the centers of the brain related to working memory, particularly visual imagery, are just as delayed as the frontal executive networks are in the brain. These networks that I'm mentioning, the executive network, can be split into four different networks. And all of them, to one degree or another, are impaired, dysfunctional, or at least quite variable in their functioning in people with ADHD. Now, one of those is from the frontal lobe into this basal ganglia that you see here. That is the what network, what I think about, information I hold in working memory, reaches back to guide my behavior and what I'm going to do through the motor strip and into the basal ganglia, the what network, the working memory network. The second network is going to go from this part of the brain through that basal ganglia, and there's your cerebellum that I mentioned earlier. That network is the timing network of the brain. It's responsible for your sense of time, but more importantly, for the timing of your actions, using your sense of time to guide behavior, to sequence behavior, and to know when to execute a behavior. Because when we do something, can be as critical to its success as what we propose to do. That's our timing circuit, and that's why ADHD has been referred to in my other lectures as time blindness. It interferes with the guidance of behavior by our sense of time and leads to massive problems in time management in people with ADHD. The third circuit of the brain is known as the hot circuit. Okay, this is the circuit that goes from the frontal lobes through the midline, you can't see it here, of the frontal lobe and down to the amygdala. So you see, inhibition and emotion regulation, that is what we think about, is going to reach down and control how we feel 
the emotions we express. And it's going to allow us to have an executive control, a self-regulation control over the emotional brain, which starts with the amygdala and in general encompasses the limbic system around here. So that's the emotional brain and that's the self-control of emotion. And you can see why ADHD individuals have such difficulty with emotional control. The fourth circuit of the brain goes from the frontal lobe, again to the midline that you can't see here, right? back to the posterior part of the brain on both sides, often known as the parietal lobe. If I back up, you can see it here on the left or on the, yes, on the left side and here on the right side. Okay. Notice that that's a little delayed too. All right. That circuit is self-awareness. Awareness of myself in space, which is what the posterior part of the brain is doing, and awareness of myself internally and emotionally. That's what the anterior cingulate and amygdala are doing. Put them together and I'm aware of myself outside and inside. Self-awareness over time. And now you know why self-awareness is such a problem for people with ADHD. As I've said, the emotional brain is involved in ADHD. You see it here. I've already drawn it for you, but it's the frontal lobe that goes down through the midline and into the amygdala here. And this is the limbic system, the emotional brain. And that is impaired in ADHD as well. So ADHD, while we call it an attention disorder, is understood now to be a disorder of executive functioning and of all four networks of executive functioning, leading to problems with inhibition, working memory, self-restraint, emotion regulation, self-motivation, planning, and problem solving, along, of course, with self-awareness, if I didn't mention that already. So how can we fit this new executive theory of ADHD into the clinical description of ADHD. It's very easy, I'll do it quickly. Executive functioning is one thing represented by the light blue box. Self-regulation over time to improve our future. We can split this idea or construct into two dimensions two broad dimensions of behavior and mental functioning, inhibition and metacognition, the working memory functions. Now, it can also help if we take each of these major dimensions or mental abilities and carve them up into very specific minor abilities. It helps us to understand the disorder and executive functioning better. And I've already described all of these for you in this presentation earlier. There are many kinds of inhibition, motor, verbal, mental, emotional, motivational, and there are kinds of attention, nonverbal working memory, verbal working memory, remembering what you're doing, planning and problem solving, and then the ability to manage emotions once they're expressed. Now, can you see how ADHD would fit in here? ADHD is comprised of two dimensions. There's the inhibition dimension, which we call hyperactive impulsive behavior, but is really a subset of that executive function dimension. And then there is the inattention symptoms, which are misnamed because they're just a subset of the problem with metacognition, executive attention, if you want to call it that, and all of its components. This is really what ADHD is all about. It's an executive function disorder. Now, I briefly want to speak about the available treatments for ADHD, and then we'll be done here. We can think of a treatment package for ADHD as ideally consisting of these five components. 
First is the diagnosis of ADHD, which should lead to understanding the disorder, what it is, that it's an executive self-regulatory disorder, understanding its causes, its neurodevelopmental, right? understanding its risks over time if it's not treated, which are quite serious, by the way. And then, as I said, learning the available treatments. So understanding. What's the first thing that should lead to? Counseling the parents, not just about the disorder, but about acceptance of a child with a disability, having compassion for this child, having forgiveness for the mistakes they're likely to make due to their neurodevelopmental disability. And that should lead to our willingness to engage in these other treatment components. So acceptance, compassion, forgiveness, and willingness to help. Those two are the first two steps of treatment. Then we will work with families on understanding the available medications in our country. Here in the US, as you'll see, we have many options. In other countries, such as Italy, Spain, or China, they may have only methylphenidate and stratira. And they don't have the versions of the amphetamines that we may have available here and in some other Western countries. So we're going to talk about medication, because after all, if ADHD is a biological disorder, then using a biological agent to change it is rational, reasonable, and humane. Just as diabetes is a biological problem for which it is acceptable to use biological solutions, insulin in that case, a medication, so too is it reasonable, humane, rational for us to recommend using medicines to deal with and reduce the risk from a biological problem. So we'll talk briefly about these medications. Then we should be willing to modify our own behavior as parents and teachers so that as we modify what we do, we can change the behavior of the ADHD child. We can't get rid of it, but behavior modification can be very helpful at both reducing symptoms, but primarily reducing the reasons for impairment, allowing the child to be more successful even with their ADHD symptoms. Finally, over here on the left, another treatment component is making accommodations. That word refers to making physical changes to the environment, to the educational curriculum, to the home and other environments to reduce impairment. Just as someone who is physically disabled in a wheelchair is impaired entering buildings, and if we put a ramp there, they can enter the building successfully and no longer be impaired. So too are there physical changes we can make to the environment so that while it doesn't change the disorder, it reduces the risk of impairment. And there are many such treatments that are out there uh, that I've spoken about in other lectures of mine. For instance, in school or at home, if we take the amount of work a child is to do and we break it into smaller components, smaller quotas, instead of 30 problems in mathematics, you only do five. Take a break for a minute or two. Then I give you five more. Then you get a break and maybe a reward and five more. Eventually, you will do the 30 the other children were asked to do, but you won't do it the way they did it. They could sustain their actions toward that assignment until it's all completed. The ADHD child cannot. So rather than demand that they behave in a way they can't, which is to do what other children do, we break the task down to fit with their executive age, their executive function. That's just an example of an accommodation. If we do all of these, we optimize the likelihood of a successful response to our treatment and more effective functioning in the environment. Now, there are 
many reasons why we want to intervene as early as possible in the lives of a child with ADHD, or the lives of children, excuse me. Obviously, one reason is that we're trying to reduce the disorder and its severity and the related executive and self-regulation deficits. And we're doing that in hopes of reducing the amount of distress and conflict within the family and maybe even risk of trauma and abuse within the family. We're also trying to reduce the likelihood that they're going to suffer in school with peers, with siblings, with other adults in the community. We're reducing the risk of harm, of impairment by treating those symptoms. We also hope to reduce their health risks. People on medication are less likely to have accidental injuries, to be obese, to have car crashes and to die in them than others. So there are many health problems that we can reduce the risk of having through early and sustained treatment. I've mentioned that ADHD causes risk for various other disorders. Some of them are due to the ADHD itself, like oppositional disorder. So if we treat the ADHD child early, we might prevent or at least reduce the likelihood of them developing another disorder. Oppositional disorder among them, perhaps conduct disorder later on, maybe even reduce the risk for depression and anxiety by adolescents. So treating early may help with comorbidity. Of course, we're trying to reduce the economic burden that ADHD poses to the family for medical care, to society because of all of the consequences of all of these different forms of impairment. ADHD costs society billions of dollars annually if it is not treated properly because of the economic downstream effects from all of these impairments and medical problems. Finally, and this is a new finding, we have shown that if you take ADHD medications and you take them for several years, it actually accelerates brain development in those very regions of the brain I mentioned that are causing the ADHD. So that by adolescence, the brain is closer to normal in its development than it would have been had the child not taken these medications. We have over 33 studies showing neuroenhancement, acceleration, what the scientists are calling neuroprotection, from staying on medication, ADHD stimulants specifically, for several years. Now, these studies, to be clear, show that only about 25 to perhaps 40 percent of people so treated show this kind of brain growth. So it doesn't happen for everyone. Also, there's a lot of things we don't know. What drugs are more likely to produce it? How long would you have to stay on that drug like methylphenidate, for instance? And how far into development do we see this effect occurring? So far, there's at least two studies that suggest that even adults can show this kind of accelerated brain growth from staying on medication. But there's just a lot we don't know. So this is new. It's a cutting edge finding. I doubt that you've heard about it, but it does suggest that there is some hope that a minority of ADHD children, but still a sizable minority, might well show accelerated normalizing of brain growth from staying on medication into adolescence. Very quickly, the medications we have for managing ADHD that are approved in the US are the following. Please understand, if you're in another country, I appreciate that you may not have access to these medications. Some of you, as I said, such as in China or Italy, may only have access to long-acting methylphenidate or the long-acting non-stimulant Stratera. But other countries, such as the US and certain countries in Europe and Canada, also have versions of methylphenidate that you may not have in those other countries. 
and may have access to the more powerful amphetamine medications in different delivery systems than you have. But let's take a look. We have seen the development over the past decade or two of new delivery systems. We used to only have the pills, the immediate release forms of methylphenidate or amphetamine. And so if you took them, they lasted only three or four hours, maybe five. So a child or adult had to take them several times a day to keep the medication in the body. By the late 1990s into early 2000s, pharmacology companies had gone on to develop new systems for keeping those drugs in the body. These are not new drugs. They're new delivery mechanisms. One is a pump. It's a capsule. And it's called here Concerta. It's an extended release form of methylphenidate. It's filled with a liquid or paste of methylphenidate. And after you swallow it, water goes into the pump, pushes down on the chamber that holds the gel, and squeezes out the liquid methylphenidate for about 8 to 10 hours. It's still methylphenidate, but it's being given in such a way as to sustain the action of the drug over time. We also have pellet versions of methylphenidate and amphetamine, in which little tiny beads of the medicine are coated with a coating that dissolves at different times. Some have a thin coat that dissolve quickly, others a thicker coating that takes hours to dissolve. Yet another ingenious way of keeping the stimulant medicine in the body for a long time, eight to 10 hours in fact. In our country, we have a methylphenidate patch that you can wear on your shoulder or on your buttocks and it delivers the drug through the skin. And therefore, the individual gets the benefit of the medication as long as they wear the patch. But the patch has to be taken off several hours before bedtime to prevent insomnia and allow sleep. Recently, we have several new delivery systems here in the US and elsewhere. We have a prodrug called Vyvanse. It happens now to only be in an amphetamine type of medication. But this is a drug that you take and it only activates in the gut, the stomach, and the intestine of the individual. This was designed to prevent drug abuse so that you can't crush it and inhale it or inject it and have it activate as well as it does if you swallow it. We have liquid versions of liquid methylphenidate and amphetamine. We have little gummy bear dissolvable gel tablets of these medications also long acting. And just a year ago, we had the entrance and approval by the FDA of a new medication. It's methylphenidate, but it has a delayed onset. You take it at bedtime, at night, and it activates nine to 10 hours later. So that as the child wakes up the next morning, the medication is activating, and we don't have that period of time in the morning untreated any longer that we used to have with the other versions of these medicines. Because with them, you had to wake the child up, give the medicine, and then wait the 30 to 45 or even 90 minutes before the drug reached its therapeutic level and began to help with behavioral control. So lots of very clever delivery systems are available for methylphenidate. We've also learned that these medicines are safe and effective in preschool children down to the age of two. That's especially true for methylphenidate that has been studied in much more detail with children. We have the drug Stratera, atomoxetine, which was available in the U.S. back around 2003. This is not a stimulant. It works very differently in the brain than the stimulants do. It also is not a scheduled or controlled substance because it carries no risk of potential abuse or harm of addiction. 
Atomoxetine lasts up to 24 hours. It can be given once in the morning or half in the morning, half at bedtime. It works on the chemical norepinephrine in the brain, making more of that chemical available for functioning in the brain than it would have previously. And it also is quite effective at managing ADHD symptoms. Because these drugs are different, one's a stimulant, another's not, they work in different ways in the brain. Therefore, they may have somewhat different effects, and certainly they may have different side effects. For instance, we know that stimulants are likely to suppress your appetite and to lead to insomnia at bedtime, difficulties falling asleep. We do not see that with the non-stimulant Stratera. Instead, Stratera may cause problems with stomach upset, and at least during the first few weeks, may actually cause sleepiness or drowsiness in the child until they get used to the medicine. So you see, because each drug is different, it has a different profile of side effects. But all of them are safe. None of them are life-threatening. Nobody dies from taking a stimulant as prescribed the way we use it for ADHD individuals. And as a result, parents can rest assured that these are some of the safest medications used in psychiatry and pediatrics. Down the uh, downstream from now, perhaps later, we may see other norepinephrine drugs like Stratera enter the marketplace. So far, we haven't seen that. They're not doing so well, but perhaps one of them might be a success. Here in the US, there are two medicines that have been used for years to treat high blood pressure in adults. It was also found, however, that they had certain psychiatric benefits, and especially that they can help with ADHD symptoms. And these are the drugs guanfacine and clonidine, and they have been reformulated into longer lasting extended release versions. And they too have been approved in our country for use in treating ADHD. But certainly the stimulants remain the more likely medicines being used along with atomoxetine. Some children, however, do need these other medications. There are efforts underway to develop new drugs, such as using nicotine and the nicotinic receptor in the brain. Uh, that is because nicotine in tobacco has been shown to have beneficial effects on ADHD symptoms. So far, these drugs have not been successful in clinical trials, uh, and therefore we may not find them coming to market. But there might be new medicines on the horizon that are based on discoveries in genetics. When we discover certain genes for ADHD that pose risk for the disorder, and we can then discover what those genes are doing in the brain, it might give us a clue as to what medicines we might have available that could treat that mechanism. So expect to see new advances in medications coming from advances in genetics. In the area of psychological treatment, we have, of course, parent counseling, as I've mentioned, about the disorder, educating them about ADHD, a very valuable step in treatment. We also have, specifically, training parents in behavior modification techniques, that is, in better, more consistent ways of parenting, which can lead to less conflict, less oppositional and defiant behavior, sometimes even a reduction in ADHD symptoms, though that often does not occur. Nevertheless, the home life can be improved and the relationship can be improved as well if children become more compliant. And there are various parent training programs available in the literature that have research showing their effectiveness. Unfortunately, we've learned that these parent training programs work best for young children. As children grow up, particularly after the age of 12, the programs are not nearly as successful as you see in the percentages on my slide here.
so that by adolescence, only about 25 to 35 percent of teens benefit from these parent training programs. That makes sense. Teenagers spend more time away from home. They're less influenced by their parents. They're spending more time with their peer group and with other adults. And those other influences become more important. So working with the parent becomes a much less likely way of changing the teen's behavior. We've also learned that using behavior management methods in school can be very, very helpful to improving performance in school. But again, as with parent training, these behavioral methods only help where they're used, when they're used, and who uses them. There is no carryover or generalization to other domains of life where the treatment wasn't implemented. So they have to be done where the problems are, and then they help. And they have to be sustained over time. If you withdraw them too quickly, you lose their benefit. I have another lecture that discusses between 80 and 100 things that educators can do in the classroom to help children with ADHD. You can also find these techniques in my book, Managing ADHD in School. We've learned that routine exercise is helpful for people with ADHD to diminish and cope with their symptoms. So routine, frequent, weekly exercise is highly recommended to help control the symptoms better and to lessen the likelihood of obesity and to improve the long-term health of the individual. 40% of children with ADHD and adults have sleeping problems. So where that happens, we need to study them, perhaps refer the child or adult to a sleep clinic, get the sleeping problem corrected, and then we should find better symptom control the next day because a tired child is an inattentive child. And if they're already inattentive, it just worsens their ADHD. So let's look for sleep problems and get them treated where possible. We've studied various cognitive training programs for ADHD, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, and we found that it doesn't really help the children or the teens very much at all. However, by adulthood, when the individual's executive system is more mature, teaching them ways to compensate for their executive function deficits can be very helpful. And there are at least three different versions of programs in the US. The most recent are those of Mary Solanto, whose program you see here, and also that of Dr. Ramsey and Dr. Rostain at the University of Pennsylvania. They have very useful cognitive therapy training programs for adults with ADHD. There's also some good work at Duke University going on by my friend John Mitchell and also by Lydia Zylowska, a psychiatrist at UCLA, who have developed a mindfulness meditation program for helping adults with ADHD also. It's not clear if it would be as beneficial for children or teens. Most of the research is with adults, but showing some very good promise at helping them to cope with, particularly the emotional problems related to ADHD. So those are the evidence-based, science-based approaches to treatment, along with the medications that I've already mentioned. There's a few experimental programs that are not yet proven, but on which there seem to be some initial positive results. So maybe eventually these will be available. I'm only going to briefly mention them because they're not yet available, and nor would I recommend them if they were available at this time. We just don't know enough about them. There's a new social skills program developed by Dr. Amori Mikami at the University of British Columbia that teaches parents a social skills program to use with their children during the normal flow of daily interactions that has very good evidence of its success to date. Most social skills programs don't work for ADHD children, but this one seems to do a better job because it's based on the executive function theory of ADHD that the other skills programs are not. Dr. Mikami has also developed a version for schools known as Mosaic is its abbreviation, 
uh, but it too is not yet widely available for implementation. But keep your eyes out. Check Google Scholar once in a while as your browser, and you can keep up with Dr. Mikami's research uh, and see whether there's a manual that's available yet. There's an after-school program instituted at high schools here in the U.S. and some cities called Challenging Horizons, where school personnel work with teenagers with ADHD after school so they don't have to go off to a clinic, keep an appointment, suffer the stigma of going to see a psychiatrist or psychologist. Their program is delivered through the school and it works on academic training, some social skills, counseling the teachers and the parents on appropriate behavior management methods that I've already mentioned, and also on sports and athletics. And we find that more teens participate in it and do better at school in that kind of program. There's some nice work going on by friends of mine who are looking at time management and organization training. Dr. Joshua Langberg here in Richmond at my university has tested and published a program on organizational training for ADHD teens that also seems to be quite useful at helping with homework and schoolwork for the ADHD teenager. A few people have studied preschool play-based curriculums for improving executive functioning. Each has only been tested once. They've only been used with children who seem to be at risk for executive problems. None of the children in the study were diagnosed formally with ADHD. And although the study showed some promise in working with children this way, we can't recommend it for ADHD because it hasn't been tested with clinic referred children as yet. I've mentioned meditation and mindfulness training is having some early success, but there are mixed results uh, and we need better research on this method. But that's another one to keep an eye out for that might be beneficial. We have tried using transcranial magnetic stimulation where strong magnetic signals are sent into the brain to try to help reset nervous system functioning in those areas. This has been used for depression more than any other psychiatric disorder. And while there is some evidence for some positive benefit in depression, at least in some studies, so far we have seen very little convincing evidence that this helps with ADHD. But stay tuned, follow the research, and maybe it will turn out it does, but not now. We have looked at using antioxidants in fish oils, such as the omega-3 or the omega-3-6 combination, as possibly helping people with ADHD. After all, there were claims by companies that manufacture this, as well as by early nutritional proponents, that giving these could improve ADHD symptoms, especially attention span. However, as better studies were done using placebos, using blinded conditions, randomly assigning people to the drug and placebo and they didn't know which they got, when those studies were done, these supplements were not found to be much, if any, benefit. So I don't recommend them. There are no nutritional supplements that can help ADHD. That's not to say that if a child is deficient in a particular vitamin or mineral, we shouldn't treat that deficiency. And maybe, as in the case of vitamin D deficiency, we might see a little bit of improvement in ADHD symptoms. But the ADHD isn't coming about as a result of the nutritional deficiency. So using the substance won't necessarily improve the ADHD, and it certainly won't do anything for children who are not deficient in the vitamin or the mineral. Things that have been tested and found not to work are things like removing substances from the diet, such as sugar and food additives and flavorings. There's a little bit of evidence that food coloring might produce an allergic reaction in preschool children with ADHD that makes their hyperactivity a little worse. But that's a far cry from claiming that food colors and flavorings are causing most ADHD, which 
Dr. Benjamin Feingold did claim more than 30 years ago was the major cause of this disorder. It is not, and that has been disproven. As I've said, adding supplements in, such as extra vitamins, antioxidants, and so on, has not been found to be especially effective at this time. There is a program here in the West used by some occupational therapists called sensory integration training that is usually recommended for children with learning disorders, motor problems, or ADHD. Evidence to date shows it is not effective for the learning or the ADHD problems, and so we don't recommend it even if it is widely available here. Chiropractors have gotten in on the action, wanting to have a treatment for ADHD, and they've developed a skull manipulation procedure, sometimes called neurologic organization training, in which they put pressure on various lumps in the skull in order to improve the neural functioning underneath it. It's a ridiculous idea, absolutely silly. It has no basis in science or fact, but parents who are not very sophisticated could be convinced to try this, and we have found there is no evidence out there for its success. Traditional therapy sometimes used for children with depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, or just having stress reactions to normal uh, stressors in the environment, sometimes play therapy or psychotherapy can help those children, but it has not been shown to help children with ADHD. So we don't recommend it for their ADHD, even if it might be recommended should they be depressed or have traumatic experiences. I said that self-control training as used with adults like cognitive therapy doesn't help children, even if it does help the adults. And I've mentioned that social skills training also does not benefit ADHD children, except Perhaps Dr. Mikami's program of friendship coaching might well be useful eventually when it becomes clinically available. A very popular treatment in the US as well as in Western Europe, which has been around now for more than 30 years, is EEG biofeedback, often called neurofeedback, in which the child is connected to a computer that monitors brain electrical activity through electrodes that are placed in a plastic helmet that the child might wear. While the child is wearing this helmet, they play video games, their brainwave electrical activity is monitored, and they're rewarded in the game for their success if they are able to increase particular kinds of electrical activity associated with better attention and inhibition. So we're using a game to train them in certain mental exercises that are known to increase these electrical patterns. And it is hoped through repetition and training and rewarding them that we might permanently change the electrical activity for the better in ADHD children. At least that was the hope. And early studies suggested that this might just happen. However, these studies were not well done they were not rigorous in their scientific procedures. And when better studies were done, now more than five large studies that did involve placebos, sham forms of biofeedback, that did involve blinding the child and the parent to understanding what the treatment was so that parents and children did not know whether they were getting the real or the sham treatment. And also, collecting information from teachers who were also unaware or blind to the treatment procedure. When all of that scientific rigor was added into these studies, the studies found no differences, meaning that much of what neurofeedback was producing was a placebo effect. Recently, we've seen people trying to develop computer games, computer apps, and other devices you can use on smart technology in order to practice brain training exercises that are believed to improve inhibition, working memory, and other executive functions. 
Some of these, such as CogMed, have already been commercially available. Others are about to become available. There are more than 300 such games and apps already available that are being recommended for improving the cognitive deficits in ADHD. So far, we have one study, and that study was not convincing. Indeed, it found almost no benefits on symptom ratings and other measures that were collected on the children in the natural setting. So at this time, there is no available evidence that using smart technology and games can be used to train up these deficient mental abilities in ADHD. And if we ever did find that, there are cheaper ways to play these games than through these clinical programs that people have developed for ADHD. Nintendo, for instance, decades ago, gave away cognitive brain training games in their brain age software if you bought a Nintendo DS or handheld device. And other game developers have done the same. Indeed, virtually all modern games involve executive functioning to some degree. Children who play these games get better at the games, but that's all. So in conclusion, I hope you've seen that ADHD is a disorder, not just of attention or of hyperactivity, but of executive functioning and self-regulation. That it's a highly persistent disorder over time, persisting in full disorder in up to half to two thirds of all children diagnosed with it as we follow them into adulthood. Another group of children remain symptomatic even if they can't be diagnosed fully with the disorder. But anywhere from 14 to perhaps 35% of people with ADHD might recover from it by age 30 or later. We'll see, but there is some chance that a small group do normalize or recover. I hope I've shown you that the DSM-5 has a set of criteria that we follow for making a pretty rigorous diagnosis a someone with the disorder that clearly separates them from typical children and adults. There's a new attention disorder that I'll talk about in another lecture called sluggish cognitive tempo, which we now think of as involving daydreaming and mind wandering. And it's very different from ADHD, even if it's being misdiagnosed as ADHD because there's no other official diagnosis for it yet. Watch for other lectures I have on YouTube and elsewhere that can teach you about SCT. Otherwise, there's information on my website, russellbarkley.org, under the fact sheets directory that you can read more about this other attention disorder. I hope you've learned that we have many treatments for ADHD and that we should combine them into a package of treatments that involve understanding, education, and changing parents' perspectives about their child, that also involve adding ADHD medications in with behavior modification programs, along with accommodations that we make at home and at school to reduce impairments. Put all of that together, you have the optimal treatment program for ADHD but especially the most effective among them are the medications for ADHD as well. But we don't recommend medication alone for most children because the psychosocial or psychological treatments also do provide some benefit, especially when combined with the medications. We've seen new psychological programs being tested. Some of them such as mindfulness meditation, friendship coaching and others might eventually prove to be beneficial enough to recommend for clinical practice. Others we have been able to rule out. But I hope that you've been impressed by the fact that while ADHD is a very serious and impairing disorder that can persist into adulthood in many cases, it is a highly treatable disorder. Indeed, one of the most treatable psychiatric disorders that we know of. We have more treatments that help more people and improve their disorder and impairments to a greater degree 
in the field of ADHD than we have in any other psychiatric disorder. So there is room for a lot of hope for people with ADHD and their families that we can make these children more successful, happier, and leading more effective lives than they are able to do without these management programs. Thank you so much for joining me for this program. I hope you've learned a great deal and watch for other lectures of mine to become available in your country or on the internet soon. Thank you.